Shalom, shalom. This is Parashat Lech Lecha. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman. And this is part B to Parashat Lech Lecha. Uh, the audio file has been split into two podcasts for those of you who uh, need smaller files. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, the first part was 30 minutes long. This next part is about 30 minutes long as well. It's entitled, Credited to Him as Righteousness. I do recommend that you listen to both of them together in one setting, but if you can't, I understand, feel free to split them up and listen to them independently of each other, okay? So, with that, we will get on with the part B of Parashat Lech Lecha, entitled, Credited to Him as Righteousness. A note, by the way, for this commentary, um... I wrote a commentary called Exegeting Galatians that is available on this website, as well as um, you could write to me and ask for it. And Exegeting Galatians was meant to serve as a companion exposition to this particular teaching that I'm about to read to you, okay? I highly recommend reading both of them together, both credited to him as righteousness as well as Exegeting Galatians, all right? You ready? We're starting at the top of page 7 if you're following on the written commentary. Throughout his letters, the Apostle Paul, which I call Rav Shaul from time to time, he seems to take great interest in Avraham, referring to him no less than 29 times. And footnote number 3 shows um, that if we assume that Paul wrote Hebrews, the count would be um, all of those locations in Romans that I listed on the commentary there, as well as some locations in Second Corinthians, in Galatians, and even if we assume that Paul wrote Hebrews, we would have some references there to Abraham. Okay? James, or his Hebrew name is Yaakov, also makes use of Father Abraham in chapter 2 and verses 21 through 23 of his letter, going so far as to bring the binding of Isaac into the equation for us. In fact, for Yaakov, Abraham's faith was perfected by his corresponding actions, and I think that's really neat. But, Germane to our study, however, is the phrase credited to him as righteousness, okay? Which were pinned by Moshe in our current Torah portion at Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and it's referenced by Shaul in Romans 4, verse 3. Let me, in fact, let me read Romans 4, verse 3 for you, okay? It says, quote, For what does the Tanakh say? Avraham put his trust in God, and it was credited to his account as righteousness, end quote. Given its location within Paul's arguments, both from Romans and Galatians, it's clear that the phrase is referring to what we might refer to as imputed righteousness, that is, positional or forensic right standing with Hashem. In fact, for Paul, it's axiomatic that Moshe describes this quality chronologically before Avraham receives the covenant of circumcision in Genesis chapter 17. I believe that this bespeaks of the correct order in which to appropriate the covenant responsibilities of God. Let me explain. On the micro, that is to say on the small end, saving faith in God, symbolized by God accrediting his account as righteous. Keep in mind the Hebrew word for righteous in, is tzedakah. Um, on the micro, this type of faith precedes the, the patriarch's obedience to the sign of circumcision, which shows up later on in Genesis chapter um, what is it? Where do we have circumcision showing up? Let me just look real quick, turn to the text. It is in chapter 17. So rather it is, it's in chapter 15 where God says, um, credited to him as righteousness, but in chapter 17 he gets circumcised. On the macro, on the larger end, the covenant of Avraham precedes the covenant with Moshe. You know, we read about Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and following, and we don't even catch up with uh, the giving of Torah until Exodus chapter 20. Thus, we can infer that Shaul brings Avraham into the argument to show that forensic righteousness is conferred to those who are not circumcised as well as to those who are re, uh, red, Gentile, and Jew, respectively. I'm sorry, let me, let me read that again. That was a little confusing. Basically, what Paul's saying is that because Abraham is circum because Abraham is credited or, or uh, because Abraham is spoken of as being credited as righteous, and because he receives this um, how shall we say status before he's circumcised, technically he's a Gentile in that in that setting, and yet because he goes on to become circumcised and continue walking in God's ways, he becomes the father of the Gentiles and the Jews respectively. That's what I'm trying to say. Let me just read Romans chapter three verse twenty nine and uh, pick up our discussion there. 
Let me read Romans 3.29, quote, Or is God the God of the Jews only? Paul asks rhetorically. Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, indeed. He is indeed. Yes, he is indeed the God of the Gentiles, Paul goes on to say. That's a quote from Romans 3.29, which fits what I'm trying to say. God is the God of both the Jews and the Gentiles. And if we just use Abraham as an example, Abraham is circumcised after he is called righteous. But let's read Paul's quote out of Romans 4, verses, this time 9 through 12, a little lengthier quote. Now, is this blessing for the circumcised only, or is it also for the uncircumcised? Really sounds like he's saying the same thing, right? Let's keep reading. For we say that Avraham's trust was credited to his account as righteousness, but what state was he in when he was so credited? Circumcision or uncircumcision? Not in circumcision but in uncircumcision. In fact, he received circumcision as a sign, as a seal of the righteousness he had been credited with on the ground of the trust he had while he was still uncircumcised. I'm still reading right out of the New Testament here, the Apostolic Scriptures. This happened so that he could be the father of every uncircumcised person who trusts and thus has righteousness credited to him and at the same time be the father of every circumcised person who has not only had a brit milah, but also follows in the footsteps of the trust which Avraham Avinu had when he was still uncircumcised. That's Romans 4, verses 9 through 12. But we have to stop and ask ourselves, what is it about the narrative in Genesis that leads Moshe to finally declare Avram, or Abraham is righteous at this juncture. Is there something within the story that would cause any reader to make the same assumption? What's going on in the mind of the Holy One? Perhaps we can draw some conclusions by looking at the passage from a telescopic overview. So, allow me to elaborate. The flow of the Genesis narrative has been an interactive look at Avraham and his contending with God ever since God called him away from his, uh, uh, from his native land in chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. There, in what amounts to a unilateral agreement, we find that Hashem promises to increase his offspring beyond number. The corresponding covenant ceremony will be later enacted in Pesukim, verses, that is, Pesukim 7 through 20 of chapter 15. However, leading up to this point and trailing afterwards is a grammatical clue as to what or whom Avram actually placed his trust in. Let's, let's uh, zero in and find out. In Breshit 12.1, in Genesis 12.1, Moshe recalls that Adonai spoke to Avram. And the Hebrew reads, Vayomer Adonai el Avram. That's footnote number four. However, if we trace every occurrence where God and Avram interact from this point forward, I think we're going to discover something quite interesting. Continuing with our investigation, Hashem appears to Avram in chapter 12, verse 5, and the Hebrew reads, Vayera Adonai el Avram. That's footnote number five. And also in chapter 13, verse 14, we find that Adonai again speaks to Avram. Footnote, footnote number 6 reads in the Hebrew, Va'adonai amar el Avram. But when we arrive at chapter 15, the narrative appears quite odd. Instead of God appearing or speaking to Avram like we just read, the first clause of the first verse records, let me read the Hebrew first, Achar hadvarim ha'eleh haya davar Adonai el Avram. The translation is, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. Likewise, verse 4 confesses, Vahine davar Adonai elav lemor. That's the Hebrew. The translation is, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying verse 6 of chapter 15 reveals Avram's reaction to the word of the Lord by stating that it was at this moment that he believed the unbelievable and it was credited to him as righteousness there's our phrase that's where Paul picks up his midrash in Romans 
I'm sorry, in Galatians. Remember, up to this point, Avram had remained childless. And, you know, you got to admit that he was probably beginning to suppose that maybe the heir of his household was to be the recipient of God's promise from Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. The narrative of chapter 15 trails off with statements amounting to, quote, Adonai said to him, I am Adonai, that's verse 7. And the Hebrew of that would be, let's see, Adonai said to him, I am Adonai. The Hebrew would say, Vayumer elive ani Adonai. That's footnote number 8. And then also, um, verse 18 records in English, That day Adonai made a covenant with Avram. Uh, the footnote in Hebrew reads, Vayom hahu karat Adonai et Avram brit. Who or what, you might ask yourself, is this mysterious word of the Lord that suddenly appeared in the parenthesis of the narrative with, in the narrative with Avram? By the way, I say suddenly um, because the Hebrew says hine. And in the footnote to number 10, the Hebrew word hine is explained by Jewish authorities as, quote, untranslatable. It's often rendered here as it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's often rendered as hear or behold. But this is an approximation of an expression that has no equivalent in the Indo-European languages. It's for this reason that it's often left untranslated. Sometimes your version won't even translate hine. In general, the footnote goes on to say, it serves to intensify a statement and to provide emphasis, is what they go on to say. Navigating the Bible, which is an online commentary that you can look at, uh, goes on to say that the intensity denotes that it was a sudden or intense experience. That's why it says, suddenly the word of the Lord showed up to him. It's just kind of an intense interaction between the word of the Lord and Avram. At any rate, I want to quote from the sages of blessed memory, the Chazal. I want to let them add their input to this Hebraic feature of the story. Let me make a quote from the... Um, Let's see, the Jewish Encyclopedia at pages 464 through 465. Let me read this, okay? Quote, In Scripture, the word of the Lord commonly denotes the speech addressed to patriarch or prophet. And there's some references there, Genesis, Numbers, 1 Samuel, and Amos. But frequently it denotes that the... It, it frequently denotes also the creative word. Quote, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. There's a reference to Psalms and... Um, there's also reference um, that says that for he spake and it was done uh, from the book of Psalm. He sendeth his word and melteth them. That is to say the ice that he's melting. Fire and hail, snow and vapors, stormy and wind fulfilling his word. The references from Psalm, uh, a, a few passages in the Psalms there. In this sense, the Jewish encyclopedia goes on to say, It is said forever, quote, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Another reference from the book of Psalms. The word, heard and announced by the prophet, often became, in the concept of the seer, an efficacious power apart from God, as was the angel or messenger of God. And there's another quote from Isaiah. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. Isn't that neat? He sent his word and healed them. Another reference from the book of Psalms. And you can compare, his word runneth very swiftly. That's in, also in the book of Psalms. End quote from Jewish Encyclopedia. I surmise that the word of the Lord is in fact the Lord, Adonai himself. The word of the Lord is in fact the Lord, yod heh vav -Heh himself. This much is made clear by the objective text and the sub uh, subsequent notations that we observed in Hebrew via the footnotes that I read for you. But let us take it one step further to complete the mystery. In Aramaic, the sister language to Hebrew, the translation of word becomes ma'amar, from which we get the word memra. Since the Hebrew word was already identified as possessing personality, the corresponding memra likewise took on an identity of its own. Isn't that fascinating? Early Jewish theologians defined the memra, uh, or the word of the Lord, with six different characteristics. In fact, in his first portion 
to the Gospel Yohanan, John, he also associates each of these uh, qualifications with their messianic fulfillment in Yeshua. Let's read them, okay? These six claims were, number one, Memra is defined as distinct, yet the same as God. This struggle as to the nature of Hashem persists to this day. It's a kind of a, we say struggle, but that, I mean poetically. Messianic Jews point to the use of the term Echad as a composite unity to assist in the explanation of this word issue. You know, the word becoming flesh, the word was flesh, the word was with God, the word was God. That's what I mean by that struggle, that tension. Yohanan in verse 1 1 states it this way In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Hebrew says, What does the Hebrew say? In the beginning was. The Hebrew says, Bereshit haya hadavar vahadavar haya im veelohim vahaya veelohim vahaya hadavar. Yeshua himself spoke of the fulfillment of this attribute. When he stated, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are Echad. That's John 10.30. Number two. The second attribute of the Memra, the word of God, was that it was the agent of creation. Yochanan states that Yeshua, uh, that, uh, Yeshua fulfills this in John 1.3. Quote, All things came to be through him, and without him nothing made had being. Now, Rabbi Shaul succinctly stated this in Colossians 1, verse 15b through verse 16. Referring to Yeshua, he quotes, says, He is supreme over all creation because in connection with him were created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, lordships, rulers, or authorities. They have all been created through him and for him. Number three, the third attribute stated that the Memra was the agent of salvation. This is according to the rabbis. This is claimed in Yohanan 1 verse 12, John 1 12, quote, But to as many as did receive him, to those who put their trust in his person and power, he gave the right to become children of God. End quote. Yeshua stated his role as agent of salvation several times, most forcefully in John 14, 6, the latter half of the verse, quote, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, end quote. Number four. The fourth Jewish attribute of the Memra was that Memra was the agent of the theophany. Theophany is just a fancy word meaning the visible presence of God. In John 1.14, one reads, quote, The Word became a human being and lived with us, and we saw his Shekhinah, the Shekhinah, that is to say the glory, of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth, end quote. Indeed, one might consider the incarnation reality of God in Messiah, Yeshua, to be a prolonged theophany, as it were, a prolonged viewing of God. And again, as Rav Shaul forthrightly stated in this time in Colossians 1.15a concerning Yeshua, quote, He is the visible image of the invisible God. Thus, a prolonged theophany, if you will. But having his own unique personality, I believe. Number five, the fifth attribu uh, attribute of the Memra, according to the rabbis, was that of being the agent of covenant signing. And in John 1.17, the author writes, for the Torah was given through Moshe. Grace and truth came through Yeshua the Messiah. End quote. This was the fulfillment of the prophetic words of Yeremiah, that's Jeremiah, written in the 31st chapter of his self-titled book, verses 30 and 32, or, I'm sorry, verse 30 and 32 in the Hebrew, but verse 31 and 33 in your English Bibles. Let me quote those verses, okay? Quote, Here the days are coming, says Adonai, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Says Adonai, I will put my Torah within them and write it on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. Number six. The final attribute of Memra was that of being the 
how shall we say, agent of revelation. Again, Yochanan writes of this in verse 18 of his first chapter of this gospel. Quote, verse 18, No one has ever seen God, but the only and unique Son, who is identical with God and is at the Father's side. He has made him known. End quote. In fact, when Philip asked Yeshua to reveal the Father, what was Yeshua's reply? It was, quote, Have I been with you so long without your knowing me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Again, that's John 14, verse 9. Isn't that interesting? Indeed, as the scholars have summarized, quote, the writings of John confirm that his understanding of Memra was 100% Hebraic. This is what Christian scholars surmise. His writings of the Memra, his understanding of the Memra was 100% Hebraic. It wasn't necessarily a new thing like a Christian thing. They go on to say that he affirms, John, he affirms that Yeshua, that Yeshua fulfills all six attributes and that all and that he also fulfills the Jewish expectations of the Memra of his day. End quote. Let's draw some conclusions to this particular set in my commentary. These next section is called Conclusions. Avram placed his trust in Adonai. That much is true. In fact, the raw data gathered from the narrative tells us that it was the word of Adonai who received the object, object of such faith. He did not merely place his faith in Adonai, in Hashem. He placed his faith in the word of Adonai. To be sure, Avram's response is unique. How so? Avram employs the moniker Adonai God. And the footnote shows that, uh, here's what Avram said in the Hebrew. He says, Vayomer Avram Adonai yod That's the footnote to number 12. And he chooses this phrase, Adonai God, or Adonai yod instead of merely yod like in, say, chapter 14, verse 22. And in fact, the Hebrew of chapter 14, verse 22 reads, El Adonai El Elyon. Unto the Lord, the Most High God, is what the translation is. That's footnote number 13. In fact, Sarna makes this shift in, makes note of this shift in titles in his commentary to Genesis. Let me read a quote from the JPS Commentary to Genesis, the Jewish Publication Society, 1989, on page 113. Nahum M. Sarna writes, quote, This Hebrew divine title, rarely used in the Torah, appears here for the first time. It is used in a context of complaint, prayer, and request. Here, the word for Lord is Adonai, my Lord, not the divine name of yod heh And its use suggests a master-servant relationship. That's what Adonai means. Abram does not permit his vexation to comprise, I'm sorry, to compromise his attitude of respect and reverence before God. End quote. So, what are we to make of this exchange? Might I suggest, under the guidance of the Apostolic Scriptures, my suggestion is that the Memra of yod heh appeared to Avram in such a way as to allow Avram to address him, the Memra, as a servant would address his earthly master in respect, which is why he says Adonai yod heh Did Avram see a man? Possibly. Did he see the Lord himself? Did he see yod heh you know, I can't be dogmatic either way. You're welcome to speculate on your own. But one thing is sure. Avram believed the unbelievable. But it was to the word of the Lord, the Mimra, that he addressed his objective faith. Surely Hashem saw into the heart of the patriarch and recognized the appropriation of the choices that lay before him. What is more, only the Lord himself can supernaturally open the eyes of a man to allow him to make a choice between choosing his Messiah or rejecting him. Avraham um, Avraham chose to lay hold 
of the promise given in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, the one that we quoted at the onset of our commentary. Avraham chose by seeing at the heart of such a promise a glimpse of the Messiah who would bring it to pass. That's what I believe is taking place here. I believe that Abraham looked into the future by faith and saw that the Messiah was the one spoken of when God said, I will bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you. And through you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through your offspring, Abraham, through the Jewish people, but namely, and more importantly, through Yeshua the Messiah. In closing, Tim Haig provides a concluding thought to our study. Quote, The response of God is said once again to come via his, quote, word, end quote. That is, the word of the Lord came to him saying, end quote. And, 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 Tim Haig is quoting a verse there. Tim Haig goes on to say, God assures Abram that he will indeed have a son, and then he takes Abram outside to give him a sign of the promise he just made. But the sign itself requires faith. For God shows Abram the stars and declares, quote, So shall your descendants literally seed be. Not only would Abram have a son, I'm sorry, end quote to the verse, not only would Abram have a son, but the descendants of Abram, Tim Haig goes on to say, would endure from generation to generation, so that in the end, the offspring of Abram would be beyond counting. Tim Haig concludes by saying, but would God's word, I'm sorry, but would God's word, as promised of a son, be enough for Abram? After all, it had been some time, perhaps as much as 20 years by the sages' reckoning, since the initial promise had been given, and there was still no son. Sarai was still barren. In fact, God's word was enough for Abram, as the next verse, verse 6, indicates. Quote, and he believed in the Lord, end quote. Moses has reserved this clear statement of Abram's faith for the moment when the promised son is specifically the focus of his attention. Surely Abram believed from the time that God first revealed himself to him. His actions prove his faith. He left Ur, traveled to the place that God has indicated, forsook the idolatry of his fathers, and he worshipped the one true God. But, Tim Haig goes on to, uh, to note, Moses intends for us to see that Abraham's faith was cast upon God in a particular fashion, that is, in connection with the promise of his son. And thus we have the all-important verse, quote, And he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. End quote. That footnote of Tim Heggs, by the way, in case you're interested, was taken from Parsha 12, which is available on his website at TorahResource.com. The copyright was 2003, and it's from page 2 of that particular commentary. And, with that, we conclude our commentary. Thus, the closing blessing is as follows. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melecha Olam Asher natan lanu Torah temet Vechaye olam nata batochenu. Barukata Adonai Notain Hatora. Amen. The translation Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have given us your Torah of truth and have planted everlasting life within our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. That concludes our show for today. Remember, because the Messiah has already come, the Torah is now a document meant to be lived out in the life of a faithful follower of Yeshua through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh to the glory of God the Father. It should not be presumed that it can be obeyed mechanically, automatically, legalistically, without having faith, without having trust in Hashem, without having love for God or man, and without being empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh. To state it succinctly, Torah observance is a matter of the heart, always has been, and always will be. My name is Torah teacher Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song, Shema, was written 
produced and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A, number 613 at hotmail.com. Or visit our website at graftedin.com. That's graftedin.com. Thank you.